Okay, well, good morning. Um, first off, uh, let's, uh, I want, how many of you have already been able to get into Moodle? Just a couple of you? I've seen a couple of people asking for, for their, uh, uh, for the password or for the key. Uh, a couple of you have asked already. Who, who has gotten in already? Okay, good. Um, well, so before I do anything, I, I didn't finish the PowerPoint last week, and I need to go back to that. But this is the second PowerPoint, and I'm going to go through very quickly a uh, couple of th uh, some things about uh, about the uh, uh, Moodle site uh, to help you get started. And I'm going to uh, um, also at the same time, uh, by kind of introducing you to it, encourage some of you to sign up for one of the first uh, presentations because somebody has to, and and obviously they need some time to prepare. And that's uh, going to happen in week three. Somebody has to present in week three, so uh, there's not a lot of time. But I've, uh, I will show you I've already provided those people that are going to present the first couple of weeks a lot of help, a lot of help. Uh, so it won't be quite as scary. Uh, so um, anyways, let's talk about, about Moodle a little bit, uh, accessing it, how to enroll in it. That is the password or the key, as they call it. Um, and uh, a little bit about how to use it. Uh, you just go to the regular website, um, or the, uh, the university website, and you see where the, the little finger's pointing here at the library. You click on the library. And, uh, and that will take you to this, the library site. And if you then click on the uh, link for information. You see one of the items under information is Moodle. Now Moodle is the name of an e-learning system. It happens to be, it happens to be probably the most used uh, e-learning system in the world because it's free and yet it's very good. Uh, some of the biggest universities use uh, a commercial uh, program that's very similar called Blackboard. Uh, but I know at uh, the university where I was at before, Kimap University in Kazakhstan, um, I was a distance learning coordinator and we had somebody visit us from Blackboard and they wanted us to pay $100,000 a year even though we only had about as many students as we have here and uh, that's, uh, that's not as good as free, let me put it that way. And free is good and Moodle is good. And I've actually been using Moodle for about 15 years uh, myself uh, doing some experimentation and stuff on it uh, start, starting a long time ago. So uh, you'll click the, uh, the Moodle link right there and that will then take you, I could do this live, but I, I wanted to also, uh, I'll save this PowerPoint into our Moodle site, and so there are other things on it that, that you'll need. Um, that will take you to this page, and so this talks a little bit about Moodle, as you see there. Among other things, it gives you the link to the Moodle site, is in that, is that under number one. Um, and under number two there, it just uh, basically lectures and students to log into Moodle, uh, you need your campus ID and password, that's the main thing you need, and you need that password that I showed you, the key uh, that I showed you, and, and we'll reiterate that in a second. Um, anyway, it talks, it's a little mixed up there between, between the uh, students and the professors. Um, I don't think yet, it does say you need the enrollment key. And uh, so let's go, so once you uh, click on the uh, the uh, link up there under number one to get to Moodle. Um, and you don't always have to go through this process. You can go directly to Moodle uh, after you get uh, signed up and, uh, and uh, familiar with it. You can go directly to that website. Um, and this just blows up, actually, it was in the last page. I'm sorry, I, I forgot that I, that I uh, just decided to blow it up because it was such small type. So not a whole lot of key information other than the fact that you're using your campus ID and you're using your regular password to get into Moodle and you need this enrollment key at the bottom, Media 2017, not too hard to remember, um, to, uh, to enroll into the class. So now you go to the Moodle site uh, by following that link and uh, I've put an arrow to log in but actually before you log in you can just scroll down just scroll down and it has uh, another link to a Moodle quick guide. And so in order to get a little bit familiar with Moodle, 
uh, go down to the little quick guide and click on that, and that will take you to this. Uh, there's some, you know, some general information to start with, and then just scroll down further, and it takes you to Moodle Quick Start uh, for students, and uh, it includes a video demonstration of how to, uh, how to get signed up. So uh, go into that, and it'll show you how to do it. Uh, then you can go back, and in essence, well, it's, um, whatever, you can take a look at that, learn what you need to learn, and then you will go sign in, again, using your regular ID and your regular password that you're getting and using for email and everything else now on campus. And, uh, and then, um, well, anyway, this, uh, sorry, this is the video. So if you saw the video, it would take you to, it would show you how to enroll. Uh, but in essence, when you click on your course, I believe it's going to take you immediately to this because you haven't enrolled yet. So it's going to want you to enroll. And you're going to self-enroll. Again, you're going to use your enrollment key. It's going to be Media 2017. Again, not hard to learn. So there's just an example for a different class. But uh, once you click on, uh, so when you go back to the top and you sign in, go back there, log in, um, and then... Um, I kind of may have, yeah, okay, you're logging in there, right? Okay, log in. Now it'll take you to, um, what do they call this? Always forgetting, they have the different word for it than they used to have. Anyway, it'll take you basically to your courses uh, if they've been set up. And so, uh, and if I were to scroll down, I'd also find there's other, this is my dashboard, excuse me, that's the word for it. Uh, this is my dashboard, so it shows me my three courses that I've created on Moodle. Um, but this is the one you want, obviously. So you'll click on that, and that's, I'm pretty sure that'll take you directly to your enrollment. Um, anyway, follow the instructions, click on there, I'm sure it'll take you in, use the enrollment key to sign up, and then you're all set. You should get an email from me, or a message from me, saying welcome and whatever. Uh, it's not too hard. If you, anybody has any trouble, as I said in my, my uh, one of my, I think, guess in the welcome card, welcome message, which is already too late. But if anybody has any trouble, not just signing in, but with anything about this system, ask. You can ask IT or you can ask me. Like I said, I've been using it for a long time, although this new version, first off, the new version is quite different than the old version. Um, and secondly, every university sets it up a little differently. And so this is not exactly the same, even though it's the same program, it's set up a little bit differently than the one I was using at the other university. So I have to kind of, I have to ask once in a while in order to save time, I, I ask, you know, how do I do this? Uh, where do I find this or that? Uh, so um, once you sign into it, uh, you enroll and sign in, then you will come to our, our uh, course syllabus and you can scroll down and read that and uh, and then you start coming to the weeks. And I haven't set up, well, yeah, I haven't set up all the weeks yet, but I've set up the first few. Uh, there will be some additional things that I'll put into it as we go along. Um, uh, for example, you already see up here the slides from my first lecture, including slides we haven't talked about yet. Uh, you also see a video of the first lecture. And so um, what I do, um, I've done a lot of experimentation and Moodle and stuff, and what I found is that um, uploading video directly to Moodle is usually not a good idea because our server is not as good as the YouTube servers. And so I upload to YouTube and embed back into Moodle. So you can also, um, so actually when you click on the video, you'll actually be watching it on YouTube. Um, the, uh, the student presentation is just the list that some of you are taking pictures of, uh, just so you know what that, I, I will replace it with your names uh, probably uh, in the future so you can uh, see that. But for now, at least you have, uh, you can at least yourself remember the order of the presentations and when they will be due. The, uh, some of you were asking about uh, this textbook here. Um, the up there is the old version. This is version two, that's version one. The content, as I understand it, has not changed too much. The, the words 
they've mostly up, up, uh, graded and updated the, some of the graphics and other things like that, but uh, that should be okay for you. Um, they have a very complicated relationship. The publisher has a complicated relationship with an NGO, which has given me permission to use it. But if the publisher ever asks you, don't talk about that because I don't want, I don't know their relationship between the publisher and the NGO. But the, the NGO has given me permission to use the textbook. I, I think maybe the NGO helped them actually start. Uh, this, uh, the publisher's name, Flat World Knowledge, and their idea is to put out lower cost publication so access to this book is only is uh, I, I told you wrong the other day I think it's thirty dollars twenty nine ninety five which is a lot cheaper than most textbooks and so that's the purpose of flat world and the purpose of of sailor uh, foundation is to get information to people out free and somehow I'm kind of thinking that sailor actually helped start flat world and now flat world allows sailor to use some of its older versions of his textbook but i don't know their relationship and i don't want to get into the middle of it so if you ever ask uh, this doesn't exist i think for now but also the sailor version only gives us the uh this part here which is the text the sailor version does not have the title page does not have the table of contents so i got the table the the, the title page and the table of contents from flat world and I got the actual text from Sailor, the nonprofit, the non government organization. That's probably more than you need to know. But anyway, it's there. The old version is there. Uh, again, the table of contents is in, the, is in the first file there, and the actual text is in the second file. Uh, it came from different sources. Uh, you also see the critique sheets. We'll talk about that today the critique sheet for how I will grade your news report that you'll be producing as part of this class, and a critique sheet for your presentations. Uh, that you will be doing in class. Uh, you, you will see, um, let me see, I think you go down one. Yeah, you see under number two, uh, this is stuff this week I will handle everything, so I, I don't, haven't put everything on there because I haven't decided, you know, I haven't uh, created everything yet on, on, on week two, but under week three, you see this would be the first presentation of some of you students. Uh, as I said, you see there are three files that would help team one, the first team to present, do their job. Uh, two PowerPoints actually created by one of my colleagues, and so it's very well done. Uh, not maybe enough text. In that case, it's mostly photos or pictures, graphics, and then he just filled in the blanks orally. So that one actually doesn't have very much text at all. And so that one may not be perfect, uh, you want to have some text in a PowerPoint. The second one, on the other hand, was done by students. Later on, I had them review the, that first chapter, the introduction. And that one has more words and fewer graphics. Uh, but basically, for team one, has a lot of stuff they can use. Now, I don't want you to just take it and use it, you know, without making, without personalizing it. I want you to personalize it. Whatever, whoever is on team one, I want you to personalize it, make it a little different, customize it. But you can use graphics. You can, it'll give you ideas and and you can use pretty much whatever you want to out of it, but just make it your own. Um, for team two, uh, there, is, uh, there are also two uh, PowerPoints there. The, the, uh, well, the very top one you see are PDFs, actually. The, the third one for team one is, is an actual PowerPoint. I think both of the items for team two are both PowerPoint, so you can that's a little bit easier to use. I'll show you how to use the PDFs uh, most effectively in a second. Um, and also I've provided it for team three. Um, let me see, I think in week, i trying to remember if we have a, uh, uh, when team four is, I think team four, doesn't do it until the next week, I think. Um, yeah, and week four, there's only one pre presentation, student presentation. So anyway, so there's there are materials here for team three as well. So the first two weeks, 
teams one, two, and three for whoever signs up for those have a lot of help already. Um, so it won't be as hard. I mean, I want you to be critical of what other people have created, even including my colleague who, who did uh, the first PowerPoint that is all graphics and almost no words. Um, uh, for those of you, if I give you PowerPoints in the future, most of the student presentation were just the opposite, way too many words and not enough graphics. And so if I give you, uh, um, and especially I will probably do that for anybody that I can. I'm not sure I have all the PowerPoints for, for it, but anybody who's using this book, like I said, this is a harder book, but I particularly will try to get you somebody else's work to help you kind of springboard from what they did. In most cases, the student team last semester who did, did this one did not have enough graphics because this book has no graphics. <laughs> and so they had nothing to copy. And so they had to go out and be entrepreneurs and find graphics that would be appropriate. And, and those that did use graphics, in some cases, used silly graphics that really weren't that appropriate either. So I want you to do better than they did. That's one reason why anybody do, doing a presentation out of this book is going to get some help. Because this book is not student friendly. And so you need help, whereas this one, this other one has quite a few graphics. In this version, they're kind of small. In the older, other version, uh, the version that's on there, they're bigger. And you can actually copy the graphics out of it. Because I'm, uh, in, if I give you any PowerPoints, it'll be in PowerPoint. Any questions on that? So I'm going to go ahead and pass this list around again. I do need some people to sign up for those first three weeks. But there's nobody get more, going to get more help uh, than the people on teams one, two, and three. Because you're doing it sooner, and you're doing you know, some fairly hard stuff, uh, particularly those in this book, teams one and three. Um, and so I'm going to reward you and help you out with that a little bit. Um, I'm going to also start passing this around. Those of you who signed up over here and didn't sign up over here, sign, you need to sign for your class one, two, if you were here and then sign for class two in your enrollment. Every day we have to pass this around, every class, everybody needs to sign in. And again, don't sign in for somebody else. That's cheating. Don't, oops, and you give you that one too. Um, and please sign up for a presentation today. And that means somebody, because there should only be about as many slots as there are people, um, although maybe not everybody's here today. That means somebody's going to be on this team, whether you like it or not. But I'll be. I already have given you some help. Okay. Again, any questions? Please do not be shy. I was actually just hearing, watching a video yesterday that uh, talked about teaching Asian students that their culture is kind of uh, the, the professor must know everything. And it's embarrassing to get something wrong, and therefore they don't—they prefer not to say anything because they don't want to be wrong. Um, that's not—that's um, not an American perspective. We're wrong all the time. <laughs> we say whatever we think, and that includes students in a student classroom. Uh, in a classroom, they—they they are very—they're—they're they're maybe say too much sometimes. Uh, but. Uh, that's more what I'm used to, is to uh, have people interact. As I said, I'm not going to do it today, but starting next week, at the very start of class, I'm going to be asking some of you questions about what we talked about this week. So uh, it won't be about what we're going to talk about next week. At the very, very first thing, I'm going to ask questions to some of you about what we talked about yet, uh, on Monday and today. So you might, I'm giving you incentive to uh, review the material. Uh, and then I, it also is important for the other uh, assessments. I've had to change the syllabus a little bit, so if you happen to get on here and look at the old syllabus, uh, it, it has changed. I mentioned it the other day. But uh, this university, not entirely because of, its, of the administrators here, but partly because the way the, the mandates of the Ministry of Education or whatever it's called here in Malaysia, um, we have to document everything. We have to document everything we teach, and we have to document uh, in very closely any assignments we give you. 
Um, and, it, and it ended up taking a lot of time just to do paperwork. Um, and that is very frustrating to me because I think I'm being forced to choose between good education and good documentation because the more documentation I have to do, the less time I have to do to do, edu do good education. And so that's frustrating. Um, but it's, it's also then just forced me to make some changes. What I wanted to do was to have you do a quiz every week. While it's fresh in your mind, have you do a, a short quiz, no more than 10 questions on the first day of the next week. Uh, but that's, I have to, even though, and this is the part that drives me really crazy as a communications technology person, here we have this system. If you go in and do a quiz, you will immediately know your score. Nonetheless, because of whoever, whoever's lack of wisdom, I have to make out an individual sheet on in print for every one of you, give you your grade in paper, give you your, your, some feedback on paper, and I have to make copies of, of uh, at least nine versions of, or nine, uh, nine of the uh, questionnaires with responses showing the, some of the best three, some of the medium three, and some of the worst three for every quiz I give you. Well, that takes a lot more time than you might think to do all of that. Whereas this is us already on the site, along with all my, all my videos, along with my, my video-based feedback that I'm gonna be giving you on top of that, so that you can go see me telling you what you were doing wrong and stuff. And so this system should answer that question, but somebody says it doesn't. And so because they require so much paperwork, I can't do it weekly. So I've decided and I basically told uh, the academic affairs that this was a result of these, this mandate of documentation that uh, I'm only gonna do it then four times during the semester. So uh, you will see if you go to the, the, uh, the, the syllabus that now there's only four quizzes uh, scheduled. Uh, every three to four weeks you'll have a quiz over all of the previous weeks. That means you have to remember it longer. Um, and I will try, I will probably have about 20 questions instead of 10, but it will cover four weeks instead of one, uh, three or four weeks. Um, I will try to make them, and then I'll show you today and, and some examples. I'll try to make them questions that are not real difficult, um, that, that if you, and they're gonna be multiple choice, maybe true and false, but uh, mostly will be multiple choice. So if you kind of remember, you can probably guess the right one, even if you don't, even if you couldn't fill in a blank, you can, re you can remember the multiple choice, hopefully. Um, so, and you'll have the questions in advance. Uh, when you do your presentations, you have to write questions also. And the, some of those will be on the quizzes. So you will see all the questions. Um, with maybe a, a few exceptions. I'm not gonna say I will never ask another question, but if I ask another question, it'll be a question that I think you should know if you're paying attention. Uh, so I could answer, uh, add a few more, and I could change some of the answers a little bit if I think that the, if you create a question, I don't think you made good responses or something, I can make some changes. So I'm not gonna guarantee that there won't be any changes, but most of the questions will come from, will be given you in advance. So it won't be that, it shouldn't be that hard. As I said the other day, I don't believe in memorization, but I do believe in incentives. And I do need to give you incentive to pay attention and, and uh, learn you know, the basics, the, what's important in the, in, the, uh, in, in the presentations. And I will probably, you, you can pretty much count on me as a very practical professional to try to um, ask questions that are relevant. In some cases, in this first one, it'll, they will be about how to get an A in this class, basically. You know, important things from the critique sheet and stuff like that, so that I can make sure you understand how I'm going to grade your, your work. Uh, so that will, will be, you know, some of the questions, questions like that. When we get to the regular content, I will be looking for material that I think could be valuable to you and avoiding as much as possible anything that I think is not valuable. And, I, and as you write questions, I want you to do the same thing. I want you to write questions that are not real hard and not real technical, not real stupid, 
uh, not too easy. I mean, they, they can't be, you can't make it so obvious that everybody's going to get it right. You know, people have to make a little bit of an effort. Um, even if I wanted to, and I, I do, I can't give you all A's. Uh, I would be fired if I did. In fact, one of my colleagues in essence did get fired because he did. Uh, so um, he's not teaching classes because he gave too easy a grades and got in trouble for it. Uh, but so that's, even though I don't really, as I said the other day, don't believe in the correlation between grades and, and, and your success in life, we're required to give grades. And that's out of my hands. Um, so make them the, the questions that are the most relevant, the most, something that you think maybe might help somebody someday in the future to remember, uh, if you can find something like that. Um, and you know, make some, like a lot of mine you will see are kind of in the backwards. I say, which of the following is not true? And then I put a whole bunch of true statements so that you can remember those things. And I make one false statement out of all of it. You just have to find the false statement. But I do a lot of kind of backwards wording of my multiple choice questions. Uh, that's a little bit easier uh, for one thing uh, than to thinking up. It's actually kind of hard to come up with good, bad, you know, good, um, bad answers. Good, bad answers, if you would. Uh, that's kind of hard. And so by reversing it and giving you all good answers except one, then I don't have to think of one false answer to throw in there. So a lot of my multiple choice questions are kind of backwards. Which of the true following is not true? And then uh, it's easier to write. And it's really, and it's more important for you too because I want you to remember the right stuff, not to remember the false stuff. So I give you a lot of true stuff and one thing that's not true, for example. Okay, so let me see if there's anything else there. Nope. So I'm going to actually uh, pause this one and go back to the other PowerPoint and finish that. Yeah, because I didn't go through the syllabus. I need to go through the syllabus before I go through the assignments. Okay, so back into history of media. Taking me into this. And uh, anyway, so here is, you know, I may have made a mistake in the first place because I probably come to think about it, uh, was looking at the syllabus and forgot that I wasn't looking at what was actually on Moodle. So here is actually what's on Moodle. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, that was stupid of me. Okay, so we already kind of looked at that. It'll be, I'm going to go back to the syllabus, which indeed does say probably what was said before, which is now the details. Okay, so in uh, week uh, three, I'll be presenting again, or in week two, I present week three. Um, there will be two, two of your groups, uh, team one, team two will be presenting. Uh, week four, only one team will present, uh, but we will have a quiz on week, on week four, um, as you see there. The uh, week five, then two more teams present. Uh, in most cases where I can match them up, it'll be one out of each book. Um, but in some cases, they don't match up perfectly. So like in week seven, both of these books are out of the, out of the larger book, the media and culture book, in uh, week seven. Uh, and also in week eight. You see, the, the, this book I also like, this was not used in previous, well, I kind of used it without permission last semester but now I have permission to use it um, because it's a little more practical. It gets into actual media and what's been happening, a little bit of their history, but also a little bit what, what's going on right now in each of these different types of media. And so it, it talks about specifically about uh, while, the, while the history, while this book talks about the history uh, or humanity in the, in the age of print, this talks very much about newspapers and one chapter about magazines in another chapter so it gets a little bit more practical um, it also talks about music the history and how where we are at with music right now it talks about radio it talks about tv it talks about all this you know movies and so forth whereas the other book is a little bit uh, low in details about the actual media and talks more theoretically about the impact of that media on society. Um, so this is more of a more of a theory book 
this is uh, it gets you know is more practical in that it talks about where we really are issues that really do exist in the media. So that's why I adopted why I got them to adopt that. So anyway, like I said, week seven um, uh, is is totally from the uh, media and culture book. Uh, week uh, eight uh, goes back to one from each. Um, the age of audiovisual from the theory book, and specifically about radio, the history and status of radio. Uh, the next week in week nine, you see where it's totally out of the media and culture. So one some of, one team will be presenting about movies, another team will be presenting about television. Um, then we'll get into uh, uh, in week ten, while the uh, theory book is talking about the impact uh, of internet on, on humanity. Uh, the uh, the media and culture book will be uh, talking about uh, first off that week it'll be uh, games and entertainment then the next week uh, both of them are from this book uh, one about media internet and social media and the other one about advertising and public relations this one talks very little about advertising and public relations it doesn't does it talks some about economics uh, which also this has also relates to economics uh, has a chapter on that uh, this one does talk some about ethics and this one has a chapter in ethics so you see in week fifth uh, and week 13 both presentations will be out of this book one on ethics and mass media one in media and government um, and so forth uh, this one will kind of wrap up in week 14 media and, and the human well-being what media does for us good or bad and uh, this one uh, talks about the future of mass media and 15 will be a wrap-up week if we get behind for some reason which we might because of holidays and stuff uh, we might you know so we might have to push some of the stuff forward going back again just to point out um, so in week uh, Week seven. So we saw we had a. Uh, what we got here. In uh, week four, we have the the online quiz that'll be done in Moodle. Um, and I actually, uh, the quiz as as the syllabus explains, will include. Um, up to 20 questions, probably 19 questions of true and false or multiple choice. And then I'll have one written question. And I've given you the written question for the first quiz right there. And so you have time to work on the written question. In order to discourage too much, um, we can call it teamwork or cheating, one or, one or the other, um, I'm going to give you a limited time in doing these quizzes. And so to do 20 questions, you might have 30 minutes. Uh, but if you know the material, that's still more than one minute per. Um, and, and I think you can get done with it. Uh, they're not going to be real hard. They're not meant to be tricky. So if you know it, you know it. If you don't know it, you don't know it. You're guessing anyway. Um, so you're going to have a limited time uh, in how long you have to do the true or the, the objective questions. But you have already done the written questions. And the written question you just copy from what you know what you've done and paste it in there. So that is immediate. Uh, you you should not be writing your answer uh, from the start uh, for the quiz. You should have already done that. So here's your question already. The question one from uh, the Nick from the quiz in uh, week four. Okay. So then you have a uh, report. As I mentioned the other day, that's in week seven, and that will cover the first six weeks. You'll have have the reports. Thank you. Uh, everybody get uh, signed in. You just got to everybody. Okay. So in week seven, you'll have your first report, and we'll talk about that in more depth here in a second. But in essence, as I told you before, I want you to write it like a news story. You're going to write it as if everything we're doing here is part of a conference. And so you're as a reporter, you're going to report the most interesting or important stuff that we talk about in class. Probably what we're talking about right now is not going to be in your report. Okay, this is irrelevant. You're going to write, in fact, I want you to write in such a way that you think that your story would be interesting to somebody not in the class. Think of your audience not in the class. So you do not presume they understand anything that happened here. 
and you certainly don't you don't put anything in there that, that would bore them. You want to put use stuff only that would be interesting to somebody not in this class. So that's what you're looking for. And you will write it again. We're going to pretend that this is, in fact, that that uh, written assignment that I already put in there uh, says, um, uh, write a complete lead. That's paragraphs basically one and two of a news story of what has been taught and discussed in class to date. Similar to your upcoming news report, pretend that our, cla our classes all occurred on one day as part of the Chiman Professional Communications Conference. So everything we, everything we do here, everything we talk about here is, happen, is going to happen on October 14th uh, at the Chiman uh, University Commu uh, Professional Communications uh, Conference. Okay, so that's your framework. Of, of how you're going to look at this. This is part of a conference you're reporting as a reporter about what happened at this conference. Okay, you understand that? So, so take on that mindset as a reporter. You're reporting this for a newspaper or for a TV station or whatever, and take that framework. This is not, you know, this is not for me. You're not writing to me. You are writing to people outside this class and telling some of them something interesting. So do not tell them stuff boring. Tell them stuff interesting. Tell them stuff that they would like to actually hear. Okay, that's that's what a reporter does. Otherwise, there's no, po no point in having reporters. If you don't write things interesting, nobody's going to read it. And so your job is to write interesting stuff, even though a lot of stuff we talk in here might seem boring to you. You're going to find in those six weeks um, or whatever it is leading up uh, that you're going to cover in this first report uh, you're going to find the most where was that um, yeah your news report you're going to find the most interesting stuff we've talked about and actually um, you're it's going to be about 500 words and I'll show you a 500 word uh, model report in a few minutes it's not very, that's not very long. 500 words is not very long for a news report. For one reason, a news report, uh, by Western standards anyway, does not include any of your own opinions. None of your own opinions. A Western news report is supposed to be a report. You report what other people say. Sometimes you use direct quotes with quote marks around them and say, this is exactly what they said. Not always exactly true, but in, that's what you're telling your readers. Um, and some of them are called indirect quotes or paraphrases. And that's basically your words saying what they said, so there's no quote marks. You're just reporting in your own words what they said. Uh, but it's not verbatim. Without quote marks, you're saying this is what they said, but it's not verbatim. This is the essence of what they said. And so you use direct quotes and indirect quotes, and you have to make transitions through them to make it make sense, make it flow nicely. Make it interesting. Um, and that's part of the challenge of being a news reporter uh, because we'll be talking about a lot of different subjects in this class. So trying to make those transitions from one idea to another idea is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, the most important challenge is writing a very interesting first sentence. The first sentence is the most important sentence in a news story. Writing a really interesting first sentence is the biggest challenge. Um, for this class, I've only counted it 15%. For if you were taking news writing from me, I would count the first sentence worth 25% of the entire paper because it's so important. Absolutely important. That first sentence is vital. Now, I was disappointed in some of my students last semester in not grasping the importance of that first sentence. And some of them were still not doing a good job even in their final report. And I was d discouraged by that. So I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that all of you know how to write a good first sentence. If nothing else, how to write one sentence. Um, and so I've given you a good model, and I, I will talk about it more, and I'll give you feedback and, on all of your papers, because your final report, which is worth, uh, let's go down further into here. Uh, you can see when the other quiz and stuff are due yourself. Um, the final report is...
Okay, so the value of this, your quizzes, four quizzes are each worth 6%, so your total is 24%. So about a quarter of your grade will be based on your four quizzes. Not a huge amount, but obviously important. Uh, your news reports. There's two news reports during the semester. Um, and so, and those um, are worth 8% each. So altogether, we're 16%. Those are important. Uh, you're uh, going back up. Attendance and participation. I'm not going to count anything on your attendance. You simply, if you don't attend, like I say, if you miss more than 20% of, of the classes, you won't be allowed to finish the class, basically. You won't get a grade in this class. So you need to attend. You also won't do as well on any of your other assignments if you don't attend. So certainly I encourage you to attend. But I don't want to base your grade on your attendance. And so I'm going to base the grade on your response when I call on you. And so I will call on each of you at least five times during the semester, maybe more, but at least five. And so each response will be worth uh, about 2% of your grade. Now, I'm not going to be real harsh on those responses, but first off, you need to be here in order to respond. If you're not here, that's, that's a zero, if you don't have an excuse. And so that's the main thing, is don't get a zero. Uh, but other than that, I'm not going to be real picky on the answer. I mean, it's got, you have to make a really stupid answer for me to dock very much off of your, off of your response. I'm not going to be real hard on your, your class. It's mostly a way I keep you listening. And also, in order to do a good report, you should be taking notes off of anything that's interesting that you might want to use in your news report. Not this, not what we're talking about today, but, but anything you think that might be interesting to somebody outside of class when we start talking about real subjects, you should be taking notes on it because you want some direct quotes and you also need to remind yourself, you know, the, the indirect quotes, what, what, what else uh, was said that was of interest. So you should be taking notes in this class in order to write good reports and in order to do well in your quizzes as well. I and mean, that helps you as you take notes, that will help you remember key issues, uh, key things, key items that might be in your, your quizzes as well. But particularly to do a good re news report, Reporters have to write notes, um, and we'll talk about the process of taking good notes a little bit more uh, another time, not today. Um, anyway, but getting to the point is your final paper is worth 40%. That's going to be about 1,000 words. It can be a little bit less, a little bit more, but about 1,000 words. So about twice as many words as your, as your uh, other reports, your other two reports. You can actually use material from your other two reports in your final paper. I'm not going to consider that self-plagiarism um, because the final report is going to cover the entire semester. And you've already written and you've gotten feedback on your other ones. But the last report will also include like the last three weeks, which are not part of your previous two reports. So the emphasis on your final report will be in the last three weeks. It's a time of summary, the time of kind of discussion. Some of the most interesting stuff we'll talk about will probably be in the last three weeks. And so your final paper will emphasize the last three weeks of the class, but you can also include some material from the previous, from the previous classes. And with that, you can literally, if you think you did well, copy and paste from your previous reports. And so the thousand words are not going to be that hard. Um, if you've done a good job with your previous two reports. It'll be basically no harder than the uh, previous reports because you maybe put 500 words of new material and copy and paste 500 words from the previous reports. So, um, and it is also, again, be new style, the same premise. It's from based on the conference we're having here at Chima University for professional communicators. And so it's still the same basis. We're still writing to people outside of of this classroom uh, and telling them the most interesting things that have happened or that are happening in this class. Okay, so I want to give you good feedback. Do not be afraid of being corrected. The best way to become better is to learn from your mistakes. Uh, and so I will, I will typically not be real harsh. I do have to differentiate 
Again, I can't get everybody an A. If I wanted to, I can't do it. Um, and so there will be differentiation, but my average grade in the last semester was the highest in our department. Let me put it that way. So my highest, my, my grades were the highest in the department. Um, there were not necessarily, um, as I recall, there were maybe out of uh, 45 students, I don't remember exactly, but maybe six A's, but quite a few A minuses. There were a lot of A minuses. Um, I don't remember exactly how many. Uh, but the average was, I believe, um, close to an A minus. Uh, I have to adjust my, we, we have a new grading system this semester, so it's going to be, I'll have to adjust a little bit to the new grading system that we have. But anyway, I, I'm, I'm going to try to differentiate because I have to, but not be too harsh. And particularly if you improve, uh, I will be delighted to give you an A in that final report. If you if you can learn what I'm trying to teach you and how to write and in, include in, in, interesting information, I'll be absolutely delighted to give everybody an A if I can justify it, even if, it, if they do yell at me. That's okay. Uh, no, show on the paper and say, look at this. We've got great journalists coming out. Uh, I'll brag about it. And I'll say, fire me if you want to, but I'm creating great journalists here. That's okay. Okay, so that's the uh, syllabus. I like I said, this is a, a, little bit, a new grading system uh, from before. Um, before A minus was a little bit higher than uh, this, I think. And I don't know, I, I don't remember exactly how they compare, but um, it's I, maybe they're actually inviting us to give you better grades. I don't know. Like I said, they gave the best grades of anybody in the previous one. Um, I think that's the details you need. I already showed you what's actually on the website at this point. A lot of stuff to look at already and lots of stuff for the first three teams to use in preparing uh, their presentations already. So it's important now probably then to um, let me go back to the PowerPoints and uh, I'll leave that open in case I need it. And what do we have here? Okay, I let me keep going through here. Okay, I guess that was everything except the questions. This one I'm done. This in this example here, I haven't given you the answers, but you can see the type of questions. I think these you saw these already um, in the uh, from last week. Uh, which of the following was not Dr. Ken uh, has Dr. Ken not done during the career his career. Obviously not a real important thing to remember, but uh, it's something I did cover. So uh, you can take a look at that uh, at my little synopsis and slide two or what are two or three uh, of what I've done. And I'll give you one of the answers will be something like uh, uh, being a TV anchorman, something like that, which I wasn't. So just remember I wasn't a TV anchorman. That's probably the wrong answer that will be put in there, something like that. Um, Dr. Kay compares your mind structure to what? What do I compare your mind structure to? I'll give you some false answers and what was the true answer? What I compare it to? Do I have to call on somebody? Somebody remembers that answer. I know that. So one of you remembers what I compare the how our mind is created and linked together. So what I what do I compare it to? Okay, it, it's uh, yeah, it's they specifically it's called an erector set, uh, where we had those pieces of metal that we put together, and and uh, in our mind are kind of like that. Those pieces of metal are like concepts, and we piece together the concepts in our mind, and we see our reality through what we piece together. Um, and as I said, uh, sometimes the way we piece our our conceptual framework together makes us think, gee, that guy's an idiot. He doesn't see the world right at all. He doesn't understand what's really going on in the world. Yeah, we may be wrong. Um, or we may be partially wrong. We may be partially right. Maybe he is kind of stupid, but he's not totally wrong, probably. He thinks he's right. And there's a reason why he thinks he's right. And there's a reason why we think we're right. And sometimes they can be, like in America right now, they're diametrically opposed. 
There are people you may have followed a little bit. The professional football players are refusing to stand up and respect the flag as they as they do the national anthem. And there's a lot of people who are upset with them. Uh, they're claiming that uh, basically the National Football League is dominated by African Americans, and they feel like they're, they, they've been done an injustice. And I'm not saying they that uh, they don't have problems that need to be addressed. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, but those of us that are a little more conservative think that they are not appreciative of what they do have in America. And in fact, I, one of my uh, students from Kazakhstan went to a university for one semester in America. It is a kind of an exchange program. And she made the, estate, the statement that at least in America, anybody can succeed if they work hard enough. And she was required to apologize for saying that. Because the liberal mindset is, no, that's not possible. This, the, the, these people are so repressed that they can't succeed. And yet people come from Africa, and they do succeed. Same race. People from Africa go and succeed. The people in the inner cities of America make excuses. I hate to say it, but that's what I feel like. They make. I have a friend who taught in the inner cities of Baltimore. And basically the public schools are a mess. They don't learn. He says he's surprised if anybody learns anything in that school. There's so much screwing around and lack of attention and lack of motivation that he said hardly anybody learns anything in the inner city school. Well, that's a, that's the first problem, and that's not that's not caused by somebody else. It's caused by their own people within their own school. So it's a very but it's a complicated. I, I I have to admit this is one of those things where my conceptual framework looks at them and saying, stop crying about it. These people in Africa are some of the most high achieving people in immigrants in America. They're coming and achieving marvelous things and they're the same race. And they're not they're not they're at they're thankful for the opportunity. And you guys are whining about it and not doing anything about it. Now, other than playing sports, you're good at that. But you're not going after master's degrees. You're not you're not doing well in the public school. You're not doing you know, too many of them are, are making excuses for not succeeding. And people in the same race are succeeding, just not with the same inner city mindset that exists in America. So to me, it's an attitude problem. Remember, we talked about number one. That's another question here. In my set of educational priorities, I'm uh, skipping one here. But in my set of educational priorities, what's the number one thing? Attitude. And that's what I think is the problem with many of the people in America is they have a bad attitude. They have all the opportunities that African or that Kazakh or that Asian or whoever goes to America, and yet the immigrants are succeeding, and the people there are not succeeding. What's the difference? Attitude. That's the main difference. I'm, they, they, certainly are, they should be just as intelligent, just as capable, but they have a bad attitude. And so, like I say, people coming from other countries that don't have as good a language, you know, from India, Asia, you know, Malaysia, wherever they're from, they're going to succeeding fine. And they have disadvantages that the people in the inner city don't have, uh, including language in many cases. So it's frustrating to me. Um, okay. Uh, the one I skipped over, according to the syllabus, each student will do which of the following. So that one would be... Um, you know, about, in fact, I might put that in reverse. I mean, which of the following is not going to be one of the requirements in the, uh, for a good grade in this class? And it's, so I'll put something in that's not a re report, that's not a quiz, that's not a presentation, and not uh, attending and responding to questions. So, um, and the last one is Dr. Ken's list of education priorities for success, which is at the bottom of the list. Memorization. And remember that. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to pause. Okay, so let's talk about uh, how I'm going to grade uh, the, the things that you're going to do in this class. Um, first off, and this got cut off part of it, I see, but um, I, I talked about this the other day. See if I can get this out of the way here. Maybe I'll move around a little bit. And this is just a copy from, from a book. 
that the cover story for the May 14th, May 4th, 1981 Time Magazine, one of the top magazines in America, entitled The Money Chase, What Business Schools Are Doing to Us, claimed that training in the nation's business schools may be a cause of a current malaise in business management. A principal criticism of business schools was put best by uh, Reginald H. Jones, a Wharton uh, MBA, who had just retired as chair of General Electric. I think the top business schools do a good job, though they could do better at teaching communication skills and providing greater exposure to the humanities. If, if I could change one degree for the people I hire, it would be English. Uh, so if they could choose, choose one, a senior pre vice president of the first Atlanta uh, corporation was uh, quoted in the same article as saying, um, I can move this out of the way. I want people who can read and speak in the language uh, we're dealing with. You can teach a group of Cub Scouts to do portfolio analysis. So I end where I began. Every professional must be a good communicator. Writing is the, is the most complex form of communication. So I want to emphasize the importance of what I'm trying to teach you in this class. I'm not trying to teach you history. You will remember what you want to remember. And I don't really care how much you remember. What I am trying to do is teach you communications. And so that's how I'm destroying this class from within, is I'm not going to care about whether you learn history too much. I am going to care that you learn how to communicate and get started on your preparing for your profession. If this is true for business people, I mentioned the other day, it's true for the, my, in, my CEOs who are engineers said the same thing. The most important thing that they missed at the university was learning how to communicate better. No matter what your field is, now you all happen to be in the field of communications. And guess what that does? More and more people in communications are becoming vice presidents and even CEOs of companies. Why are they doing that? Because they know how to communicate. And so if you go into take your skills into PR and marketing, for example, you will have the capability have the possibility of zooming up in the organization charts. Um, if you decide to stay in the field of journalism, you'll have an exciting career. Being able to, you have basically being a journalist gives you uh, kind of a free ticket to talk to just about anybody you want to. Uh, I have spent an hour by myself interviewing uh, Bill Clinton, for example, or President of the United States. Um, I've interviewed other people of that kind of status uh, because I had my free ticket. I was a journalist. So it's a, it can be an extremely exciting career, and you can do a lot of good with it. You can help people understand things better. Um, so, going on. I would also uh, like to explain that I think when I went, I told you before that my strength was in math and science. English was not my strength. And so at the university, that was still a problem for me. When I took English composition courses, I was still struggling. Again, my version of struggling is, you know, A minus is a struggle. B plus, I'm not sure if I ever got any B pluses, but maybe a B plus once in a while. Um, you know, out of 4.0, my average was 3.83. So that's not, I didn't struggle a lot. But... That was the one I had. I really had a hard time with, comparatively. And so I, and I struggled until I took, started taking journalism classes. What I've, I've come to the conclusion that um, English teachers don't know how to teach English. They don't know how to teach composition. And the reason they don't as a group is because they have no no real philosophy of what of how to be good communicators because they're not journalists a journalist a journalist has to compete for his livelihood a journalist future depends on him being on the front page sometimes and he's not going to be on the front page of his newspaper if he doesn't know how to write well uh, he's not going to be if he's a tv reporter not going to be leading off the news if he's not a good tv reporter uh, that's very different than an english professor English professor just has to teach. Um, even if they, they might have had a little bit of professional experience, but probably very limited, maybe 
magazine writing is not as structured. So they might have been successful in magazine writing. They might have even written a book that's not as structured, uh, not, as, uh, not as complicated, not as competitive uh, as is journalism. Journalism is competition every day. Um, how to uh, either get on the front page or at least you know, be respected and being, you know, people, the editor wants to get your material because he knows you're going to do a good job. Uh, he's not going to fret because uh, he's going to have to, it's going to be so painful to go through your material. Um, but he knows you know how to find the most interesting stuff and you know how to put it together in a way that is smooth and, and pleasing to read. Uh, so um, once I started, and mostly, in this context, what I learned from journalism was I told you the other day, is stop trying to sound smart. I learned that the content was important. And, and the words were a way of con conveying content. And in fact, the simpler I wrote, the better understood the content was. And so I began emphasizing content and not trying to sound smart. I wanted to be smart. Basically, the content set tells me whether you are smart. Uh, the writing is whether you're trying to sound smart. And in fact, many people try to cover up their failings in content by trying to put a whole bunch of extra words in there to make them sound like, ah, I am really smart, even though they said nothing in what they wrote. But their content was garbage. But they sounded smart. No. That's, so what I learned is a, in my journalism classes was to give good content and not try to sound smart, try to make it simple, make it skimmable, make it easy to read. Use shorter, shorter sentences. Use words that I, before I was trying to use words that I didn't, that I myself as a native English speaker did not quite control. And maybe I didn't quite use them just right, according to the English professor. Um, and I put together a lot of compound sentences that were really long. And sometimes that's, when you make long compound sentences, uh, it, it's easy to, to make it uh, to, to make mistakes grammatically. Uh, it's much easier. When you write a complex sentence, it's much easier to make grammatical mistakes than if you write a simple sentence. Subject, verb, object. That's simple. You guys can do that. You try to make compound sentences, make them, and then suddenly things don't match up right. You start losing track of your pronouns, what your pronouns refer to and so forth. You start making mistakes when you start making it more complex, and so did I. And so, as I said, I still got my B plus and A minuses trying to just sound smart. And then, after I started taking journalism class, they just started to sound, just give good material and sounds simple. And then after that, all my English composition classes were straight A's. No problem. Uh, many students have come to me after they've taken my journalism classes and, and they've, you know, learned how to do some of these things that I teach, and they come and say, why didn't my English teachers teach me this? They have no philosophy. They have, you know, as a journalism industry, we have a philosophy. As I said the other day, we rewrite for the 14-year-olds. We don't write for the PhDs. And yet, my very, when I started my master's degree, I'd already been a journalist for... Um, only four years, a professional journalist for four years, uh, four and a half years, I guess. But I had very responsible positions. I, I was uh, started off as a reporter and then very quickly became editor of a of a hundred thousand, hundred twenty thousand circulation weekly newspaper in Tampa, Florida. Um, it was very challenging. We were competing against two daily newspapers and lots of other media. Tampa is a big city. And so we, we had lots of competition, and my job was get people to read our free newspaper. Because if they, um, it's one thing to give it away to people free, but what you're really selling for a newspaper is their attention. So the, the management of the newspaper did, made some very serious mistakes, some very, that ultimately forced them to sell the, the newspapers. Because they didn't understand this. They didn't understand what I understood as a journalist, and that is, we are selling people's attention. We are not selling the number of papers that we're, that we're printing. That is irrelevant. How many papers we print is irrelevant. We printed 120,000. We put them out. 
but how many were actually read? And so I was trying to create content that people would read with a new newspaper that nobody had seen before, or they were just getting familiar with, building new habits of readership that they would want to come to our newspaper and not just read from the daily newspapers that already existed and existed there for decades. They already had habits of reading those daily newspapers. They did not have a habit reading our newspaper. So I had to give them a reason to read our newspaper. One of the reasons I left after two years was that my boss thought I was being too controversial. And he wanted to make it very non-controversial. And I told him straight up, I didn't, wasn't mad at him. I said, I won't stay here for that because you're going to destroy the newspapers. And I was right. Um, after I left, I, I bought my own newspaper, a small newspaper in the rural part of Washington State. Um, they tried being non-controversial for three months, and then they they lost all, all of their readership. They started losing their advertising, and so then they tried to become even more controversial than I was. Uh, so it was kind of funny. Um, but I warned them of that. You, you have to get readership, and we had a relatively, we had relatively few pages, and if you did not report on the most cutting edge, interesting, controversial stuff, I warned them, you're going to lose your readership. You lose your readership, you lose your advertising. You lose your advertising, you lose your newspaper. And they did. They lost their newspaper. They had to sell it. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, that's, again, I learned that as a journalist. I knew that, or I knew maybe knew it instinctively. And so I did the same thing when I bought my own newspaper. I bought a newspaper that existed for 20 years under, under uh, the, that a, cup, uh, a man and his wife had been running. And I believed that I could do a better job than them. Um, and so I bought the newspaper from them, and I was very controversial, uh, probably in some way more controversial than in the big city. Uh, I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but it's actually harder to be controversial in a small city than in a big city. Because in a small city, you make somebody mad, you make all their relatives mad too. And so in a, in a small town or in a village or small city, you can get a lot of, you get, you make somebody mad, you make maybe half your readers mad. Uh, in a big city, they, they kind of take it for granted that, you know, that's, uh, most people don't know who you're writing about. Uh, so it's pretty much irrelevant if you're controversial, other than getting readership. That's the irrelevant part. As far as getting people mad, that's not relevant in a big city like Tampa. Um, but while I made a lot of people mad in the small city, they read my newspaper. And I doubled the revenues of that newspaper in one year. I doubled its income, its revenue. And so after two years, it really wasn't what I wanted to do long term. I sold it, made a nice profit, went back to my master's degree. All getting back to the point I was trying to make, which is uh, because I had some experience and a lot of the other master's students didn't have any professional experience, particularly as you know, editors and publishers of newspapers, uh, the faculty wanted to do research with me. And so one of them immediately came with me. I was there like one month or something. He came to me and said, Ken, I want your help on this research project. So he gave me the idea. He wanted me to uh, do a survey of magazine editors and ask them what they thought about the quality of journalism students. I told you I've, I've done a lot of research on this, and that's where it started. Um, it was his idea, uh, but he basically turned it over to me to create the questionnaire, come up with a database, send them out, analyze it write the story, and I did all of that. He changed about two words, and he sent it off to one of the top journals uh, in that, at that time in journalism. Um, within a very short time, I think within just a, maybe three weeks, we got a letter back from the editor of that journal. Um, because both bylines were on the story, even, uh, the, it was addressed to the professor, they said, this story is this article written so well so clearly that even though we have a stack of submissions from professors all over the country, we're going to run this one in the very next issue, and we're going to make it the number one article in our next issue. Well, that imagine my surprise. Uh, I had been in the master's program like two months. I had no idea how to write research. Uh, I had purposely done my done the survey in such a way that I would have open quotes. I had a lot of open questions. So I would ask them, I not only said, please please rate on a one to five scale, 
the quality of journalism students in this area and that area and so forth. But also, t and then and another question, tell me, you know, what it is that you think. I, I, I showed you a slide the other day. What, what is it we can do to improve the students? Why is it that you're dissatisfied with the students? I, I gave them open-ended questions, so they give me quotes. Because as a journalist, I want quotes. That's how I write good start articles. So they gave me good quotes in their articles, and that's why the editor loved my, my story. That like I said, the professor did hardly anything but give me the idea. Um, and again, I was floored by the fact that I would get that sort of response because I not only didn't have my master's degree, I hadn't even finished one class of my master's degree by the time we got that uh, response from the, from the editor of that, of that magazine, so, or that journal. So my point is this, even though as journalists we write for the 14-year-olds, guess what? The PhDs like it too. PhDs are busy people. Busy, they, they want to be able to skim material and get through it really fast. That editor of that journal loved what I wrote because he could skim it. And I wrote it interesting. I wrote it like I would a journalist. What's the most interesting thing? I can put it in the lead. I'm going to put the most interesting stuff there. I'm going to use these direct quotes. I'm going to humanize it. I'm going to, you know, do all sorts of things to make him, to make it more like a news article. And he loved it. But it started with writing simply. Not trying to sound like a professor, like a PhD, because I didn't know how to sound like a PhD. I didn't, I hadn't finished one course in my master's program. So, in all of your writing, you have English composition courses here. Write simply. Worry about the content. Write simply. You'll do better. I can't guarantee that's true for every professor, but from my experience and my students' experience, they've come up and asked me, why didn't they teach me this before? Uh, it's true for most professors. Right. Worry about the contents. Other than that, make it interesting and simple, easy to skim, easy to read, and you'll, your grammar will be better, uh, the reading will be easier, and even a PhD uh, editor of, a, of one of the top jur academic journals in the world will like it better. So, um, I also, I never took, I'm not sure, I may have taken one course in public relations. In my master's program, we had some that kind of related, you know, one on propaganda and so forth. I'm not sure that I've ever taken a course in public relations. But when I went into PR marketing, uh, I mentioned I did that uh, when my kids were in high school and stuff, and I went left the daily newspaper where I was up all night and hardly ever saw them. Um, I was very good at it because I knew what the editors wanted. And so I would write my press releases like I would, a, like a journalist would. And so I was getting free stories on the front page or in the front, either the front front page of the entire newspaper or the front section of the newspaper uh, because I wrote like a journalist because I was one. And so, you know, we got the lead story on the, t on the TV news and so forth. People wanted my material because I wrote it and prepared it like a journalist. 95% of all press releases are thrown in garbage uh, because they're written by people who have no clue. Uh, the best PR directors are not going to hire somebody without some professional experience. So when you become a journalist, and that's my recommendation, that if you want to go into PR, become a journalist first. Understand what it's like to work in a newsroom, and then become a PR person. You can just, you know, one or two years before you go into PR, and you'll be a much better PR person because you'll, when we write, we write to somebody. There's been research that shows that we have somebody in mind typically when we write. Uh, and research suggests that if you're in a newsroom with a really tough editor, you're basically writing to the editor. If you're in a newsroom where the editor is soft, he doesn't criticize, he lets you do pretty much what you want, then the reporters start writing to, in some cases, that imaginary people, but people, they're writing to their audience, and sometimes they get this white knight syndrome. I'm going to go right the wrongs, take out your sword of truth, and they become much less professional in the sense of uh, keeping the, the standards of, of Western journalism because they're out there trying to right the wrongs of society. Right now, we have an epidemic of that in America where journalists are not being good journalists. 
Uh, they're re reporting on stuff and not doing a good job of research on it because they want to go right some wrongs that they imagine to be taking place. Um, so anyway, they so we write to somebody. We have somebody in our mind when we write. I mentioned this class, I don't want you to write to me. Yes, I have to grade it, but I don't want you to write to me. I want you to write as if you're writing it to the people outside the class, writing to your friends that you that are in other majors and so forth. I want you to think about them. And it's really important. I'm going to grade based on that because I know that's important. I want you to write so that it's interesting to your friends. And I want you not to presume that, that your readers know everything that happened in this class because they don't, right? If they're not here, they don't know everything that happened. So you can't take it, you can't be writing uh, about something that, uh, that and, and presume that they understand the, the context of it. If it's worth writing, you're going to have to provide some context and explain why it's interesting, why it's important, what's the background to it or whatever. It has to be understandable. And I'm going to be reading as if I were your friend outside this class. And so, again, I don't want you to try to sound smart, but also I want you to be to think about that person out there. Give enough the story that that person will understand it, because that's how I'm going to be reading it. I'll be reading it like your friend, not like the professor here. And don't try to kiss up to me. Don't try to say, oh, that is, uh, according to the smart professor from Chiman University, I've had some students last semester trying to kind of kiss up to me and how they wrote about me. No, you'll get downgraded for that because that's PR. That's not news writing. So don't try to kiss up to me. Write, write it like a journalist, not like a PR person. Okay. You, later on, you can use it as a PR person, uh, your skills. But here, we're going to write like journalists. Um, so anyway, I think I pretty much covered all of that. So this is uh, on the well, this kind of introduction to the critique sheet. When I actually, if I give you the critique sheet on paper, because the university wants me to, um, this probably won't be included. But this is the background to how I want you to write your news reports for this class. So based on my lectures, student presentations, supplemental readings, recommended videos. So it's not just what happens in the class, but also I'm putting some videos on on Moodle for you to, that you can watch. Um, uh, based on all of those things, the student will write 500 words about the most important and or interesting information and concept presented or referenced during the assigned period of time, you know, usually three or four weeks. And example A paper is shown below. We'll get that in a second, along with the news report critique sheet on which scoring will be based. Students should write these as a journalist, emphasizing the most interesting aspects of the course presentations in the lead, the first paragraph, and summarizing other interesting ins insights in paragraphs two and maybe three, then use direct and indirect quotes from specific sources, the professor, student presenters, the textbooks. Yes, you can, you can quote as if they were at the conference, the textbook authors. So you can pull a direct quote out of the textbook if you want to, and just uh, pretend that that, that writer was at our conference. You have permission to do that. Um, Anyway, uh, from all these people in the videos, you can quote the videos as if the person on the video was at the conference. Uh, to provide additional detail about what people said or authors wrote that impressed you during the week um, or during that period. The purpose of these assignments are twofold. To help students achieve long-term rather than short-term memory through information analysis, synthesis, and communication. I do strongly believe that. That if you write about something, if you have to think about it, if you have to analyze it, if you have to express it, you will be much more likely to remember it, as we talked about in the last class, than if I give, than if all we have in here are quizzes. And so that's another reason why I want you to make this what's important to you. What do you think is important that you're learning in this class? And so you, by writing about it, you'll retain and remember the what important things you have learned in this class. Um, and the second uh, purpose is to give journalism students more experience and new style of writing that they will use in the real world after graduation. So those are my purposes in doing what I'm doing. Uh, top of the critique sheet. 
I mentioned the most important sentence is the lead. And this, uh, in my analysis, will be worth about 15%. Um, that's not an exact number. And it ha may have a bigger impact than, than just 15% because if you do a really bad job, you might get 5%. So you may be dropped 10% of your grade right in that one sentence. It's so important. Yes, it's 15%, but bam, you lose 10% right there if you do a bad job. So really, really work on your lead. It's very important. Um, the strongest element of the lead is what I call the whammy. Uh, in my book, some call it the hook. Generally, all the generally put the whammy element to the front of the lead where it will get the most attention and the attribution, the source of the information, to the end. The lead is the one sentence first paragraph. One sentence first paragraph. It is the most important sentence, sentence in your story because it will largely determine whether or not people will read the story at all. It is typically made up of 15 to 35 words, 35 maximum. Uh, 15 is fine. Uh, the complete lead, as opposed to the lead, the complete lead includes the lead plus another paragraph or more that together summarize the story's primary five W's, who, what, when, where, why, and how, before proceeding to the body of the story for more detail. Uh, an example of, of simple speech interview lead is this one, that you would be something you might use in a class. The internet has totally changed the way professionals conduct modern marketing, says uh, Chiman Professor Ken Harvey. So in the speech interview lead, as I say here, is probably the main lead you'll use in this class because you're reporting based on speeches and interviews. Well, not really interviews, but basically speeches. Uh, so since we're reporting on speeches, this is the sort of lead you would want to use. So the first part of the lead, of the first sentence, is what did they say that was interesting? And then who said it? It might be me, it might be one of you, it might be uh, the textbook author, it might be somebody in a video that I have you, have you listened to. Um, but so what did they say interesting? And who said it? Very simple to write, and yet many of the students last semester did not. And so I actually changed my critique sheet to try to make it as obvious as possible. This is what I want in this class. I want you probably to use the interview speech lead, patterned after this, which is a very simple lead. But it's a powerful lead, and it's obviously not the lead you'd use for all news stories if you were a real reporter, because not all news stories are based on speeches and interviews. You might write crime stories, sports stories, you know, all sorts of stories that might not fall into this category. So. In my crash course, which I've give, also put on Moodle for you to look at, it talks about lots of other types of leads. But this is the one that is most obviously the one that would be used in this class. What was said interesting? Who said it? Really simple. Um, so for purposes of this course, this should be the most commonly used type of lead because our stories uh, are based primarily in speeches and interviews. So it begins with the most interesting thing said in the speech, or interview and ends with the attribution. So who said it is the attribution. That's what we call attribution. Who do you attribute this information to? Uh, whether it's a direct quote or an indirect quote, who said it, who gave you the information, that's your attribution. Um, so the, the next part, excuse me, is uh, the basic five W is in, uh, included in the complete lead. So make sure that you have included a summary of the basic five W's of of your story, who, what, when, where, why, so forth, in the first two to three paragraphs, called by um, yeah, called by some, then the complete lead. In this course, I have given you permission to make up some details for this purpose, such as in this example below, uh, from the example A report. Uh, Guth is really the author of a PR textbook. My class was using not a live participant in the pretend conference. So. Get this out of the way. The example of paragraph two in this story is Guth was the keynote speaker. Um, well, actually, Guth wasn't quoted in there, so I did change a little bit. Anyway, Guth, in, in the example I think I use, and the, the lead is by this Guth, uh, the, the, this uh, textbook author, was the keynote speaker for the conference, the decline of mass marketing, and the rise of consumer folks marketing at Chiman University in Malaysia on June 15th. Speakers at the conference who expl uh, also explained how mobile technology is quickly providing 
broadband internet access to the most remote villages around the globe, which is saving in, uh, which is having a major impact on PR marketing as well as on world cultures. So that was that. That second paragraph was a summary of other things that I was going to report about. So it helps kind of fat make tell the reader we're not just going to talk about how the internet has changed marketing. We're also going to talk about these other things. And so that sets you up then to begin writing the body of your story and start maybe with the first thing that I was that's in the lead about how it's changed how the internet's changing marketing and then going to one of these other subjects it refers to. Um, and we'll go to the, we'll see the model in a second. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, you guys can read it, but we also will then talk about attribution. Um, the most important aspects of this is first, uh, under A, use multiple sources, especially since you're only going to be doing two of them, during the, or well, three of them, counting the final. Uh, you're going to be covering a, a large span of time. Don't just quote me. You know, quote some students, quote the textbook authors, quote videos, quote other sources, not just me. Okay? Um, secondly, the, under B, essentially every paragraph should be attributed. Who said it or where did you get your information? Be specific with full names and titles in the first reference. Then family name only thereafter. In other words, the first time you quote me, it would be Professor Ken Harvey said, the second time you quote me directly or indirectly, it would just be be just Harvey said. Okay. Uh, use in, use direct quotes. So I want you to write down some direct quotes as you're listening in class and use them in your stories. They make it more direct quotes make it more credible because you're telling your reader this is exactly what he said. Uh, and secondly, it makes it more interesting because when we quote people, it's more natural. It sounds it it, it makes it more personal. Uh, if you quote me, I'm going to sound different than if you quote one of your classmates. And so the, it, it gives more variety in the writing if you do use direct quotes, because we talk differently. Uh, the, the, somebody on a video that I might have you watch is going to talk very differently than I do. And so it makes your, it makes your writing more interesting by qu having direct quotes. And so I like to have uh, somewhere it says here about 40% direct quote and 60% uh, summarizing in indirect quotes or, or parap paraphrase, somewhere around that. Uh, I'm not real strict in that number, but to me that's an ideal. And, and I, I know I quote more than most journalists, but my readers like it because direct quotes, again, credibility and personality, both. Uh, and those both are, are valuable in, in, uh, in, in writing a story. Uh, interweave your quotes and paraphrases or your quotes, direct quotes and indirect quotes, in other words, and again, it talks about 40, 60 is my rule. Uh, but I can't always do that. You know, sometimes I don't have enough direct quotes to make it 40, 60 in the real world. Uh, but that's what I like to do. And be specific. Uh, don't write, the speaker spoke about freedom in America. What does that really tell you? That's very vague. Uh, but instead, be very specific. The speaker says competition of ideas is the key to maintaining, maintaining freedom in America. So the second one is what I want. I want you to be specific. Uh, watch out for that word about. I'm not saying you can't ever use it, but if you use the word about, ask yourself, is this a boring sentence? Does this sentence have anything of value to anybody? Or is it an about sentence where it really has no content? Uh, very little. Uh, it's the subject, it's not the content, it's not the detail. So go after the detail, not the subject. Um, some language I mentioned, I'm going to try to downplay the language a little bit. I do have to understand what you're talking about. So seek, you know, use the word grammar and spelling check, whatever you have to do to try to do your best job at making it clear to me what you're trying to talk about. It will also help, as I said already, if you're using simple sentences and simple paragraphs. You'll, it'll be much easier for you to avoid making mistakes if you're using words that you know what they mean. Now, maybe you, your vocabulary may be a little bit different than mine, and I may say, no, that's not really what that quite means. Uh, but I'm not going to be real picky about it. Uh, if I understand what you're trying to say, I'm probably going to ignore it, uh, by and large. Uh, simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. Flow is the other challenge I mentioned already. You're covering maybe 
in one of these stories, maybe four or five topics that we talked about during that period of time. How do you make transitions from one to the other? One key to that is your second paragraph. Just as I showed you a second ago, if you write your second paragraph and kind of you know, make some, you know, explain about some of the things that were, were, that were uh, discussed at that conference, now it's easier to, for you to then make a transition back to that subject later in your story. So that's one key to making transitions. Uh, it's also how you, you look how to link them. And so uh, if, I, if I'm talking about how the Internet's changing the world of marketing, then I go to another subject. I actually kind of suggested it in that example second paragraph, which is, uh, um, let me go back to that a second. I gave a clue to it already. So I said, uh, you know, speakers at the conference also explained how mobile technology is quickly providing uh, broadband internet uh, access to the most remote villages around the globe. So, you know, so I'm talking about how the internet is changing marketing. Now it's pretty easy to make a transition to this next subject uh, because now people uh, can, you know, you can work here in KL and you can communicate with people in the villages of Kazakhstan. Uh, Ten years ago or five, you know, eight years ago, you could not have because they did not have mobile broadband yet. But now you can create a marketing video. They can see it. Uh, in those remote villages because they have mobile broadband. They will probably never have wired uh, uh, broadband. They're going to skip that generation. They're going straight to mobile. And probably you know in, in your countries, wherever, you know of villages like that. They will never have wired broadband. They're skipping directly to mobile. And so that changes the world of PR marketing as well. So now you make that transition. Uh, the, the internet is is now allowing uh, PR marketers to to reach into the most remote villages in the world. That so you make that transition, then you uh, have but but in that last subject, but the you know so you make a transition. However, uh, not everyone considers uh, the the new outreach of of organizations to be a positive thing because it's changing local cultures. And changing language. So, so now we go to the third subject. Okay, so you try to find ways to link your subjects. And you may, while we talk about the inverted pyramid and how you take the most interesting subject first, uh, usually, yeah. But you still have to somehow link them. And so you may not exactly take it exactly in the order of importance. You may find have to look for those links. How do I link this subject to this subject to this subject to this subject? Because now you're, like I say, you're reporting to maybe four or five subjects in your paper. You have to link them together and make that smooth transition from one subject to another. So you look for those links. Um, I'll double check your basic English. Um, and then there are some rules for, uh, for how to use direct and, and indirect quotes. And I'll just cover very briefly here. We'll talk about some more later. But there's basically some textbooks have re have divided um, the direct quotes and quotes into three categories. Type one is when the attribution's at the start. This is usually an indirect quote. So the example is Harvey said one of the strongest trends in online marketing is native advertising. So the attribution's at the start, and one reason why it's at the start is that you don't want your reader to be confused at who said that. If you put it at the end, and it says longer than this, this is a fairly short sentence, but say it's longer than this, and your attribution doesn't tell, the, tell you tell at the end, you start off with one of the strongest trends in online marketing is native advertising, you start thinking that you don't know who this is coming from, you start thinking it's the writer's opinion. So that if you start off with, with an indirect quote without the attribution, you can mislead the reader into thinking that it's your opinion. And so you don't want to do that. So you put the attribution at the start very frequently with an indirect quote. So they know who said this. By the way, in broadcasting, most of your quotes are type 1 because they can't read it. They're, now they're just listening to it. And so you tell people who said something before you tell them what they said. That's a little difference between print and broadcast writing is that where you put the attribution. Um, 
type 2, the attribution's at the end, and this is most commonly uh, true with, an in, with a direct quote. Because now you can go ahead and now, because you have the quote marks in print, ever, in print journalism, they can tell this isn't you writing this. And so now you're getting the, the content to the front, and you're putting the attribution to the end, kind of like we did with the, the lead. Now the lead breaks this rule, by the way. The lead is a type 1, or excuse me, a, 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 the lead is a type 2 indirect quote. Because it's short, I want you to make it short, and, and in the lead I want you to get the most interesting stuff to the front for sure. So I'm saying take a little bit of a risk here, put your attribution at the end of the lead, even though the general rule is, is for an indirect quote to put it at the front, not in the lead. In the lead, make it a type 2 indirect quote. Uh, so this isn't a perfect, it's not an absolute rule all the time. Um, if you are sure that you're, if it's short, for example, like the first one there, that with that type 1 there, um, that could probably be a type 2 because it's such a short sentence. And so the reader's not going to get very confused before they get to the attribution of this of that example under type one, and so it could be a it could be a type two, uh, but generally type one is better. Type three it comes in the middle, and again it's uh, typically a, a a direct quote, and so in the example here you quote you pay for native advertising, Harvey said, but it blends in with unpaid content including some of your own. Um, Anyway, another example uh, after that. The, the first example, by the way, there's two examples here that, you, that help you understand how to punctuate it. In this case, the attribution is going in the middle of a sentence. Therefore, there's a comma after set, because the sentence has an end. This, this, this last part still depends on the first part, so it's still part of the same sentence. In this example down here, uh, it's great in two sentences. So it, it, it's uh, ending the first sentence and then the second sentence is a new sentence. And it's, so it's different. It's not a common of period here because there are two sentences here with this. So in the paragraph, there are two sentences. And this one here is just one sentence. The attribution block and drop in the middle. We do that comma, uh, comma here uh, because it's still part of the same sentence. No period. Uh, use your verbs, uh, verb tense strategically. Magazine style is typically to use present tense verbs, attribution, like it says, um, because magazine articles are frequently written many months before they're published. Kind of like books. I mean, books are even more so. Books can be written years before they're published. But magazine articles may be three, four, five, even six months old when they're published. Therefore, you don't want to tell people when the interview took place. Because then you're telling them, this is old news, by the way. <laughs> you don't ever tell a reader. Uh, you, don't, you don't want to have to tell the reader that, you're, that they're reading something old. Uh, you want them to think it's current. So in magazine writing, we very frequently use present tense attribution, uh, such as uh, says. Uh, whereas if you say when something happened, and particularly that's true with daily newspapers especially, uh, you need to, you say when they said something, and therefore you have to use past tense. If you're going to say when it occurred, you have to use past tense, even if you just suggest it, even if you say where it happened. If you, once you say where it happened, it suggests that it happened in the past. But the very fact that you identify where it occurred, well, it didn't occur right, it didn't occur, occur tomorrow, you said it happened, you know, they, they were at the city council meeting or whatever. Even if you don't say when, you've already more or less said when. Uh, that, that it was in the past at some point because you identified the location. So when you're writing uh, with a daily newspaper, it's almost always uh, pre uh, past tense uh, attribution. Uh, as a weekly newspaper editor and writer, I used to always try to use present tense attribution because I would be trying to, especially if I was competing against a daily newspaper, I didn't want my reader to think that I was reporting old news. And indeed, I wrote my stories in a way that they were more up to date. And so I might go to a city council meeting, the same city council meeting that the daily reporters went to, but I would also maybe call up uh, somebody, one or two people afterwards, and, and get more quotes. And I would report, even though some of the quotes I got at the city council meeting, I would treat it more like an issue-oriented story. 
Not that it all, that, you know, I would not identify that they said this at the city council meeting. I just says, you know, councilman so-and-so says this. Uh, whether he said it at the meeting or later or whatever is, is not, was not relevant in my story because I was covering the issue, not the event. And so in competing against daily newspapers, I would try always to use present tense attribution to make it sound like I was at least as timely as they were. Um, otherwise, if I put a date on it, I might be a week after them. Uh, I didn't want to do that. Um, so you use it strategically. And even though you're, I told my students this last semester and they just could not resist. In this class, I don't care what you, you want, to, you can try it the other way in other classes. But what we've learned as journalists is that you almost only use the verb to say, you may think it's boring, your readers won't notice. In fact, when they do notice is when you start using other verbs. That's when they notice. If you use a verb to say almost exclusively, they totally ignore the attribution. And they only go to the ideas. They only think about the ideas. They ignore the attribution. And so if you look at the, uh, the daily newspapers and, uh, from America and, and, uh, and here locally, even the Star is, is a pretty good newspaper, um, you will say, see that, that um, they usually stay with a verb to say. Um, and so I would challenge you to think that way, because once you start using other verbs, now you start putting in connotations, you start making, uh, some of them are just grammatically incorrect. Like some, I, you know, some people use the word to smile, like a verb of attribution. You don't smile a sentence. Nobody ever smiled a sentence. Uh, and so to smile is not a verb of attribution. Um, to claim. Only use the verb to claim if you are wanting to suggest that this might not be true. There are times when, as a journalist, you will do that. But to claim suggests it's not true. Uh, or at least there's a possibility it's not true. So unless you're trying to imply that, the neutral verb is to say. It, and State is also neutral, to state. But why say to state if you can say to say? <laughs> it's shorter, it's simpler. So even a neutral verb like to state, we try to avoid it. We try to stay with the verb to say. And as I said, if you do that way, go look at the New York Times, go look at the Washington Post, go look at some of the top newspapers in the world, and you'll see it to say, to say, to say, to say, to say. And you've never noticed that before because when, you, when they only use to say, you don't notice it. That's the whole point. And you don't want them to notice it. And once you start saying to claim, to state, to question, to you start throwing other verbs in, you start noticing the attribution. And the attribution shouldn't be noticed. The attribution is, is pretty much irrelevant in most cases. Again, once in a while it becomes relevant. To claim is a good verb for some situations, mostly for investigative reporting, when you have reason to think the person lying to you. And if you're going to say to claim, have some evidence that they may be not be telling the truth. That's when you say to claim. Otherwise, leave it out to say. So use your verbs strategically, but mostly the verb to say. Don't think you have to do more than that. Uh, content is going to be important, so you see 50% for this class. Not in my, not in a writing class, it would not be 50%. But in this class, um, again, moving this down for video purposes, um, I'm saying 50% in order to give you uh, in order to make the grading a little bit easier for you. Uh, because um, this is not a writing class. I don't want you to complain that I'm grading you too much based on writing. So I'm being, being grading you mostly in content. But certainly in the environment of your writing. So you're not going to get a real good grade if you don't write well. Uh, but I'm still going to say that if you give me good content and your writing is bad, you're not going to flunk because your content is good. Uh, so... Um, and again, it's uh, number C there, no first-person comments or second-person references. So don't use I, we, you. Use, go, stay in the third person. That's journalistic. Um, journal, professional journalists once in a while break that, but it's very seldom. That's the very, very few, you know, out of, out of 100 articles, you might find one article that breaks that rule. And so while it sometimes occurs, it very rarely occurs. So we, we write in the third person. So they, um, he, she, they, 
so forth. Um, and also no personalized conclusions. I know that a lot of TV journalists throw in personalized, stupid personalized conclusions, trying to kind of personalize things. And print journalists laugh at them, you know, uh, because their their little you know cliche endings have no journalistic value. Um, I understand. I'm not going to argue that uh, too much. I, I know TV journalists will argue why they have their little cliche endings, um, and there might be a value to it in trying to personalize the news. But uh, as strict in strict in, in print uh, writing as we're doing for this class, you don't put cliche conclusions to it. If you feel like you need a conclusion, save a quote for the end, a direct or indirect quote at the end. Don't put it as your own. Don't put your own opinion at the end. Don't put your own opinion any place. That's not. I'm wanting. I'm wanting you to learn to write like a journalist, and that is no opinions of your own. Uh, so if you feel like you need a conclusion, I do sometimes, but I don't write it myself. I make it as an indirect quote or direct quote, and make that direct quote or indirect quote not a critical one that should have been at the top of the story, but one that kind of does give a nice little ending to the story, not a. In fact, one reason why you don't put important stuff at the bottom is because in print journalism, the editor is free to cut any place, and he usually cuts from the bottom. Um, that's called the inverted pyramid. We don't write to a conclusion in, in uh, Western journalism, and it started in, in uh, the Civil War in America. The telegraph was just becoming uh, a dominant form of, of communication in America, and during the Civil War, where the North fought the South, uh, nearly a million people died in that war. Um, one of the things that one side or the other would do to gain some advantage was to blow up the telegraph line so that the other side couldn't communicate with their other people in their army. And so if they're in the north, typically the south would be the one blowing up the telegraph lines. If they're in the south, it might be the north blowing up the telegraph lines. But the impact was on journalists they would be. They would start telegraphing their story back to New York or Philadelphia or some part of Washington D.C., and suddenly, bam, lost the telegraph line. And so, uh, what did the editors say? Give me the most important stuff first. And so they started writing in that style, giving the most important stuff first. And as, as, as they realized after the war, you know, like people like this better. People like the most important stuff first. And so they, they adopted the inverted pyramid style for almost all news writing um, around the world, but particularly in the West. I don't know, maybe not so much in this part of the world, but definitely in the West, it's all almost, you know, 90% inverted pyramid. Uh, there's some off takes of it. And like I said, even for this class, in theory, the inverted pyramid suggests that you should put all of your topics in order of importance, but it may not be practical as you're trying to link them together. And so maybe you're subject to that. You know, if you're talking, if you're using talking about five different things that happen in class, you know, the put thing you put in so, as your topic two and your in your sequence may not be the second most important, but it links well to the first important, the, the first topic. And so there are practical reasons why why the inverted pyramid is not perfect, but in a newspaper, very frequently the editors when they run out of space, they go. You just cut it at the bottom, at the end of a sentence, obviously. But they expect the story to be written in such a way they can cut from the bottom any place they want to at the end of a sentence, and that story will be understandable. And so that's the inverted pyramid. So that's the other part of it that, that editors uh, realized was this is very practical. We run out of space on stories all the time. We may get a 40-inch story, and we have 10 inches for it. Three-quarters of that story is going to be gone. We only have 10 inches. And so come 10 inches, it's gone. And so there's a very practical purpose for editors, uh, print publications. Um, and so, you know, more or less try to keep the idea of the principle of the inverted pyramid, but it won't be exactly inverted pyramid all the time. Some things like, and in some cases, you can't write an inverted, inverted pyramid. Um, with a sports story, for example, you have a, a, a football game, a soccer game, as we call it in America. Well, the first thing you're going to report in the lead is who won. Maybe something important about what happened in that, in that uh, sports event. Uh, and then after you get done with your summary at the top, 
you probably go chronological. Okay, so there are exceptions to the inverted pyramid rule, uh, but it doesn't make a lot of sense after you've told that you do tell the ending, typically at the start, you know, with your first two paragraphs, you tell what happened. But then typically in something like that or some crime stories, some there are stories where you're going to go chronological. But, for example, speeches are not an exception. Speeches, in fact, if you're listening to a good speech, the lead may be in the last paragraph. Because a good speaker is building to a conclusion. So speaking is not the same as writing. And so as a journalist, if you, you will be tempted to write, if you cover a speech, you'll be tempted to write it chron chronologically, and you should not. You may very well find, as I said, that your, that your lead, that your first paragraph should come from the last part of the speech. And so you may turn that speech totally upside down by the time you're done writing about the speech. So that's not an exception to the inverted pyramid rule. Uh, that's just the easy way because you're following your notes. Oh, that was, you know, it made sense to you, it reads nicely, but it's not inverted pyramid and it's not the right way to write. You want the most important stuff at the, at the start and for a speech it may be at the end. So, um, okay. So here's an example of inverted pyramid, um, and we are out of time. But let me just, uh, you can, uh, this is not just an ex example of, uh, excuse me, I wasn't really trying to say inverted pyramid, although it is basically. This is an example, a model of an A paper for this class. This paper is 499 words long, not counting the introductory stuff. So starting with with the first sentence, it's 499 words long. So I've said 500 words, this is close enough. Um, you will see then that it's, uh, there's that part, there's this part, um, and that's it. There's basically, uh, in single spacing, it might fit on one page, maybe just a little more than one page. Um, double spacing will take you, obviously, more space. Uh, the yellow there would be considered our lead. The green with the yellow together are the complete lead. Uh, the blue is a bridge. It's a way of making the transition into the, the body of the story. It is technically part of the body, the bridge is, but it's your transition into the body. And the, the uh, bridge is very frequently what I try to do, and this is uh, talking about writing like, a, like uh, a mathematician. What I do is I make the, the lead an, an indirect quote. That's my word. And, and almost all leads are direct. Well, if they're not indirect quotes, they're not direct quotes. Direct quotes in the West are very, very few in uh, for the lead. Instead, if it's a speech interview lead like this, it's an indirect quote. Then, voila, paragraph three is a direct quote that says kind of the same thing but more detail. So the lead says, marketing in the U.S. 21st century are undergoing dramatic changes, says David W. Gus, an American public relations expert visiting Malaysia. The direct quote says, with the development of databases and the ability to capture data off the internet, we are marketing are becoming more individualized. They can hardly be called mass marketing or mass communication anymore, says Gus. So the third paragraph reflects back on why it's undergoing, one reason why it's undergoing dramatic changes gives you more details, but it's basically saying much the same thing. This is why it's changing. So now this leads off the body of your story, it kind of starts off where you started the story, you're now starting the body of your story. And so it makes a nice smooth transition to lead into the rest, and that's one of my mathematical formulas for writing. And I make I use an indirect quote at the start, I use a direct quote that reflects the indirect quote, but expands on it for the paragraph three, and I start going back and forth, direct quote, indirect quote, indirect, direct quote, indirect quote. The indirect quotes allow you to, to uh, make your story smooth. It ties your direct quotes together and to make it in a smooth way. So your indirect quotes or paraphrases are very important in, in making your story smooth and make it go from start to finish. So that's why I go back and forth and back and forth. Not exactly. Uh, but approximately. Okay, any questions? Sorry, I think well, we covered most of the most important stuff that you need to know. You had questions about it, a lot of questions the other day. Um, this, I hope, uh, answers a lot of them. These PowerPoints and the videos themselves will be on 
uh, the Moodle site for your review um, on next week. Uh, you know, certainly review this stuff because I will be asking some questions at the start of the next class. I'll be calling in some of you by name and asking you, you know, what is a lead? You know, how does a complete lead uh, differ from a lead? Uh, why, you know, how did inverted, py inverted pyramid start or something? You know, I have questions uh, uh, that are based on these, on these PowerPoints. So be familiar with it and be ready to answer some questions as we review this week at the start of next class. And you guys are going to reflect back to me what you learned.